ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome back. Um, uh, once again, I'm um, Brendan Dooley, uh, and um, we are um, at the point in the program where we've had a, uh, a wide ranging discussion this morning. And now we move into our um, afternoon sessions, the first of which is dedicated to our keynote speaker. Now, um, Jane Chapman is a professor of communications in the School of English and Journalism at the University of Lincoln. She's a comparative media historian focusing on aspects of print culture, such as newspaper, periodicals, and comics, cartoon records, especially that relate to underprivileged and neglected voices uh, from the 19th century and the world wars, including women and social movements, some of which I believe she's going to show to us today. Uh, in fact, her highly commended book, Comparative Media History, practically established the field of comparative media history. We commented a little bit about that this morning in terms of what uh, some of our research groups are attempting to uh, accomplish in the field of, of um, uh, comparative uh, media history. Now, her productivity has included also actual media per se, where she is the author of over 200 television films and videos by way of her own independent production companies. Um, produced a educational films and series for UK broadcasters, such as Women the Way Ahead, um, another one, Europe by Design, another one, Cider People, that was for HTV West. Uh, she was also Breakfast TV's first on-screen reporter for the North of England. On the academic side, she's authored or produced 13 academic books and well over and over 40 articles and book chapters. She's won awards from the New York Film and TV Festival and the Best Media History Book of the Year by American Universities and Best Academic Article of the Year by Emerald Publishing and shared the 2017 Colby Prize for Victorian literature for the Rutledge Handbook of 19th century periodicals. A lot of this is from her dedicated Wikipedia article, I have to admit, uh, which is very informative. Uh, since 2005 at the University of Lincoln, she has received uh, numerous research grants in journalism and cultural heritage uh, for the British Academy, ESRC, AHRC, and she and her team have also been active in public history, both nationally and locally, to enable research and commemoration of the centenary of the First World War, rediscovering hundreds of original cartoons in soldier, news, soldier newspapers produced from the trenches. And she was an advisor for the BBC World War I at Home uh, program. The political career, again, we leave to Wikipedia readers to freshen up on. Um, because I don't want to take any more time away from the talk that she has so generously offered to give us, entitled Challenges Beyond the News, the Rediscovery of Neglected Voices. And thank you so much, Jane, for being with us, and the podium is yours. Thank you, Brendan. That's great. Well, I didn't expect you to dig so deeply into my past, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> thank you anyway. Um, right, I'm going to declare an interest straight away because Neglected Voices is um, one of my current projects for uh, publishing with Palgrave, um, which I've uh, shared uh, an interest with, with uh, Sandy in the past. Um, so I, anyway, I'll, I'll uh, come back to that. What I was hoping to do um, in this keynote is to draw together a few bits and pieces and ends from your extremely fascinating program. Um, uh, I won't necessarily talk about the early modern period. It's not so much um, periods of history that I'm uh, particularly um, interested in in this talk. It's more the theorizations that bring us together and um, extending the boundaries of the title of this conference. Now, I have to say, I was not frightfully keen on the title of this conference because, <laughs> sorry about that, Brendan, um, because um, 
I believe that the study of newspapers, which I, I've specialized in, as Brendan says, extends beyond or should extend beyond events to themes and undercurrents and neglected voices. Um, so I'm going to argue that uh, events and narrative uh, go beyond that, but they, that is how the very process of going beyond that is how we end up with impact. Uh, so off we go. Now, first question, how do events change symbolic environments? Well, uh, they can re-articulate existing structures um, or they can change structures, help to change structures. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, they can transform cultures um, and I'll come on to say more about that, and because events are not only spatial, that is confined to a country or countries uh, or places or towns or cities, um, but they're emotional and they're also uh, temporal. Um, and so according to uh, William J. Sewell Jr., um, the uh, events are actually uh, acts of collective creativity. This reference comes from um, a series of essays of his uh, called Logics of History, Social Theory and Social Transformation. Um, and uh, in one of his essays, he argues that events change structures and they do so as acts of collective creativity. So in other words, events are more than purely narrative um, uh, or purely impact. Now, um, going beyond that to underlying cultural theories, some of this here on this slide will be very familiar to you, um, such as new cultural history, for instance, uh, Carr, the work of E.H. Carr, Collingwood, Derrida. Um, the reason I still uh, am a fan um, of new cultural history, which reached its, uh, its peak in, in the 1980s, is because it's led to a democratization of history in two ways, uh, an extension of sources and at the same time democratization. And for me, um, I'm, you know, I'm no fan in general of post-structuralists, but, but Derrida's theory of traces has been particularly important because it argues that you can find traces in records that actually uh, make history. So uh, you don't have to stick to the mainstream. In fact, um, if we go back to Stuart Hall, who's very relevant, his work very relevant in my presentation here, um, history as a minority event is the speaking which previously had no language. Um, and I'm drawing also on Robert Danton, French historians will remember him um, to do with the French Revolution. He of the Great Cat Massacre, brilliant book title, by the way. Um, but uh, he's got a new one coming out, or he did last year, and a very interesting essay, which I'd recommend to you in the American Historical Association magazine, Perspectives, um, one of their 2020 editions, I think the final one, of 2020, where he talks of collective consciousness. Um, as uh, a historical force. Um, and this is going to be relevant uh, for me today. Just a quick cartoon for you. This is not just wallpaper. This is a First World War cartoon um, that you see there from um, uh, uh, a specialist newspaper of the, um, the Wobblies um, who were anti-war, of course, First World War in America. So they have this character, which I don't know if you can see because the, the boxes are uh, kind of the face boxes um, are in the way on my screen anyway. Um, this character called Henry Dub, who's the kind of typical working man who always gets it wrong. So he signs up to the First World War and um, the capitalist uh, says, um, when you're part of the war, you get all these services lined up there. You know, you uniform for yourself, you get a doctor, you get a nurse, you get a chaplain, you get food parcels, and you get clothing, brilliant, in war. But outside of war, you lose it all. 
you get kicked out. This is a reference to post First War, World War um, recession and unemployment. And the capitalist says, um, I've got no place for you in this factory, um, no place for the sick or the old lame. Of which, of course, there were so many after the First World War. Um, you Irish were quite lucky to escape some of that. Um, so, uh, relationships between events and collective consciousness that Darnston refers to. Um, how do events actually become in, absorbed into the collective people, a collective worldview? You know, you take an individual event and, and some of the events in your papers uh, today and tomorrow are very specialist. Um, how does it become a collective consciousness? Well, this quote in the middle here um, by a survivor of a volunteer, again, First World War, um, a volunteer regiment called the Sheffield Pals, kind of sums it up for me as a, as a pacifist. Um, he says it was two years in the making it was, that was when he said that, obviously the First World War was longer than that, uh, apart from the Americans, of course, um, but for the Americans, that is. But it was 10 minutes in the destroying. That was our history. So this underlines how fragile historical record can be uh, when it's open to interpretation uh, and when events are open to interpretation. And the picture of the black, black soldiers is, well, I'll come back to black studies that I draw on quite a lot later, um, is, uh, you know, is kind of symbolic of their lost history. These people uh, had to fight to, after the First World War, to actually be remembered, if you like, for their contribution. As did German POWs, again, your, uh, I don't know, I can't do that, sorry. Um, this is a set of cartoons that we discovered from a, a, a German prisoner of war camp in South Lincolnshire, near to my uni, uh, done by a prisoner of war himself that depicted life as a prisoner of war. And um, uh, they were sent out to, um, to dig you know, to trenches and labouring, et cetera. Um, these people's history is, is very much, it wasn't an event for them, um, which they recorded themselves, but it was very much forgotten. So sometimes the absorption of events into collective consciousness can be very slow and very difficult. Um, and this is particularly true uh, of this example in, in a book I wrote last year, a, a, little, one, a little book. Um, and it takes basically as the primary source, and this fits in with your theme and the Euro news theme, um, letters of complaint, right? Um, and letters of complaint by black people and ethnic minorities mainly, who were forced with compulsory repatriation from Britain um, after the First World War because the troops came back and wanted the jobs. Um, so sometimes events throw up messages that actually resist incorporation into collective consciousness. Um, such as the compulsory repatriation, which resonated hugely um, at the time I wrote this book uh, two years ago, because, um, or just less than two years ago, because it was kind of being discussed um, uh, worldwide um, by the then, um, well, more controlling right wing forces in various countries. Um, so but my merry message here is that unpopular messages are often squeezed out by events, uh, which fits in with Hall's theory that uh, we looked at just, just now. So the neglected voices approach that I'm espousing, um, if it's so problematic to extend a definition of events, why bother? That begs the question. Well, the reason I would bother is purely because um, otherwise the uh, it becomes forgotten history, right? So there are, from my experience, vast arrays of undigitized documents, sources out there for all periods of history that can, can that can contribute to reconstructing neglected voices in in history. Um, forgotten texts which should be revived. So um, 
they're often undigitized, as I say. They, they, there's often a lack of direct voices. I mean, you will know this um, from any period of history. Um, so often you have to rely on third party views about those people um, who didn't write themselves for whatever reason, you know, sometimes illiteracy in earlier periods, as, as we know. Um, but the third party views are often offensive by today's standards. And that's particularly true of the book I showed you on compulsory recapturation, um, where some of the uh, civil service and army records about these people who were being repatriated from Britain after the First World War was, very, was blatantly racist by 21st, standard, uh, uh, 21st century standards. Um, so we have to go to the context, though, because we can't just, you know, in this case, put a label of racism on everything. Um, and the context call for event revival as well, uh, quite clearly. 1919, um, you know, an approach to history by years doesn't always work, in my view. I'm not a great fan of that 1893 one that an American scholar did. But 1919 is a, is a good year. Uh, for events, um, because it's transnational, uh, America, France, and UK, for instance, all had race riots following the First World War. Um, and so, as you can see from press cuttings here, our, you know, the press cuttings become our primary source here. And sometimes the newspapers of the movers and shakers themselves, the African Telegraph, for instance, was the newspaper um, published from London of Africans who lived in, in London. Um, and the journalists themselves speak out uh, quite obviously, um, but the ones that spoke out in previous years over the centuries were often incredibly brave. Uh, and I'm, I'm looking here at um, Ida B. Wells Barnett. I've written about her um, she's a good American uh, example in um, a book in 2012 called Key Readings in Journalism with um, Elliot King and myself. And um, uh, she spoke out bravely for many, many, many years um, through her own newspapers and employed else in other newspapers against lynching of black people in the, in the US. Um, so she is a real female pioneer journalist. Uh, of course, there are others as well. Um, now, events uh, interact with themes, and the themes can be ongoing and uh, longer term. And here's two visual examples for you that are, ah, are conflicting um, interpretations of the same event. Um, staying with the Black theme for the moment, um, but on to 1923, the left hand uh, cartoon, if you can call it that, uh, caricature, um, depicts um, a terrible, terrible event um, called the Black Shame in 1923 in Germany, when um, under the uh, regulations of the Treaty of Versailles for occupation, allied occupation of Germany, um, to prevent the First World War happening again, they thought, they, the Allies, um, they, um, the French sent in their ace uh, troops, uh, the Tireurs uh, Senegalese, uh, who were the Senegalese sharpshooters who had been so brave uh, in the First World War, um, but they were black. And the local Germans, to their shame, hence the shame, um, resented being occupied with and, and have, having that occupy, occupation uh, monitored, if you like, uh, policed um, by black soldiers. And this is what the left-hand cartoon about is about, um, which is, it makes you quite uncomfortable, I think. On the right-hand side is what the black man himself has to say at the same time. Um, and he points to the Treaty of Versailles, the end of the First World War, and the call for peace. Uh, you know, throughout the 20th century, particularly the mid-war period. So we have uh, peace as the, the female on the left, and on the right hand, we have the African male who um, uh, is saying, well, where are the Africans? Where are we? 
And in his hands, he's holding ribbons um, that he would like to have put on the wreath of the piece that the female is carrying. And it's very difficult because it's a poor quality uh, reproduction, I'm afraid. Um, uh, it, it, it's difficult to read the ribbons, but he's calling for all the principles. And this is the point, it's not events. The event has prompt principles he believes in. Um, and he is representative, he says, of, you know, with the, with the author field of black people. Intellectual slavery, far left holding, then criminal codes, he wants criminal, you know, criminal codes of black prejudice. And I'm afraid my eyesight isn't good enough to see the next one, but you get the point. Um, uh, there are, and on the right hand side, past laws, that's more legible. Color bars, we know all about that from, from history. Black riots, well, yes, I've just told you about that and you would have known anyway. And I'm afraid I can't see the other one. Um, so uh, here we have a very um, important quote to my thesis, I, I feel, from Danton. Um, Events come clothed in attitudes, values, frames of mind, recollections of the past, uh, projections into the future, full of passion, hope, and fear. Well, yes, I mean, when you think about that, it's quite obvious, um, but we should never forget it as historians, because that leads us back to the sources. And it may be that literary sources, for instance, um, you know, from literary studies would point particularly well uh, to this kind of uh, broad um, definition of events from, from uh, by Danton. Um, so irrespective of the period, or example, there's obviously baggage to consider, isn't there? It's not just the event by itself. Um, no. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Mm -mm -mm. Mm -mm. Um, down, down. No, sorry about this. Uh, up. Um, yes, here we are. So this one. This is a cartoon that's a series of little sketches about marital disharmony. Um, you can only see three. I'm afraid it, the internet didn't want me to copy it into a PowerPoint, unfortunately. Um, the point that emerges that I want to make to you is that there's a tension between events and ongoing issues, as you can see already from the evidence I presented. And that tension, this is the point for us with news, that tension is evidence in, evident in newspapers, right? You just need to find it and analyze it. So the press itself presents a tension. Now, as journalist studies, in journalism studies, we often, and, and as lecturers for journalism, we often point to a tension between newspapers. So, for instance, between tabloid newspapers in the modern age and uh, broadsheet, um, or between left and right newspapers, you know, this is irrespective of the country. But in fact, the tension is also there within the newspaper itself. And it is a tension, I would argue, between events and the ongoing issue. Now, the little bit of text to the, the left of the picture tells what is to me a phenomenal story, uh, anecdote anyway, um, from the 19th century. Um, in 1888, the uh, Telegraph in Britain, um, I'll come on to some non-British examples in a minute, um, published 27,000 readers' letters. That is one hell of a lot of readers' letters, right? Um, prompted by one article only, and this shows the power of the press for discussion and, and discourse, yeah, and for the power of news that is the topic of our conference. Um, by, it was prompted by one article by an early 19th century feminist called Mona Kerr that appeared in the Westminster Review, a uh, venerable uh, periodical at the time, where she referred to marriage uh, um, very uh, aptly in my view, as a vexatious failure. 
Um, and that was because divorce was, was being discussed at the time, as it has been many times uh, within the history of, of Ireland and Britain and everywhere almost. So what I draw from this is the perception of events is as important as the events themselves. Um, now, uh, if this is the case, um, then what I would advocate is scholarship that combines things and events, yeah? Um, on the right is a, a lovely uh, drawing, um, which I deeply love, of um, uh, from French newspaper history. Now, uh, I don't know if you know La Fronde. Um, you will know the um, early modernists, I'm sure, or, um, of the original uh, La Fronde rebellion uh, at the time of Mazarin, was it not? The French historians. La Fronde was resurrected as a name at the late 19th century um, and uh, modern French historians or, or newspaper historians particularly or literary studies will have heard of La Fronde. What happened was an actress called Marguerite Durand was financed by Rothschild uh, to start a newspaper uh, called La Fronde, which she called La Fronde, and it was peopled entirely um, by uh, women, right? Not just the journalists, but also the printers, the compositors, you know, the, the whole lot, the whole caboodle in big offices in the center of Paris. The only man, the only man was the concierge on the door of, of the offices. Um, now, La Fronde did not actually publish women's stories at all. That was the interesting thing was they wanted to prove that they could do as well as the men at a time when, in fact, they couldn't get access to the law courts to do any law reporting. Um, you know, they had to, to dress as, as men. Um, they couldn't get access to government circles, etc., etc. They certainly didn't have a vote. France was very tardy in the vote, uh, you remember, um, uh, in introducing the vote, that is. So La Fronde tried to do regular news and it had a checkered history it collapsed, it then restarted, um, and it suffered from an identity crisis. Anyway, if you want to know more about it, um, it didn't last beyond the First World War. Um, it was a, you know, Belle Epoque phen phenomenon. Uh, there's a, there's a, a chapter on it in this book here, which is my little um, thanks to Sandy plug, because uh, he is on the editorial board of this, <laughs> uh, this, this one, The History of the Media. And um, back to the point I was making, I, um, uh, I think it's a good idea when doing monographs, for instance, to uh, combine a, a perspective like gender, it doesn't have to be gender, um, with a theme like citizenship and then newspapers as well. And, and so you, you can mix and match match. I mix and match in this book. I've got a bit of French uh, newspaper history, a bit of Indian uh, newspaper history, the freedom movement. Um, I'm particularly keen on the role of women in the freedom movement in, in India. That was my ESRC grant, Brendan referred to. And UK women, the suffragettes, um, well known of course, but I published a few angles that were a bit un unusual on them. Um, so early 19th, uh, 19th century and early 20th century. Um, that's that one. Uh, right. Um, but I also believe that you should go to neglected sources. So here's two examples of neglected sources. On the left, we have a newspaper called the Chronicles of the New York, New York, sorry, New Zealand Expeditionary Force uh, from the First World War. Um, so the New Zealanders' contribution, they are, their armed forces to the First World War, and they did their own cartoons. Now, this is an event, right, an event for them um, to entertain their fellow readers who were other New Zealander troops. Um, although the, this particular newspaper, um, uh, Trench Publication, did get very big circulation, uh, 25,000 or so, it was, it was, it was, it went beyond New Zealand uh, to other Anzacs and, and to, to Britain. So it was some, they were sent for, for training to Salisbury, 
plane in England uh, before they went off to the fronts. And they were sent on a route, route march. So top left, um, uh, off he goes, our, our hero on the route march. Um, then after he's been 10 miles, you'll see he's beginning to flag and his rucksack looks a bit more prominent on his back. Um, bottom left, after he's only got two and a half miles to go and his rucksack has become enormous and his boots have become enormous and he's sweating streams. And by the time he gets back to sling camp, the rucksack has actually squashed him as have the boots totally. And it's all, as you'll see down the bottom, in loving memory of the march to Sling uh, in 1917. Now, the right hand example, just to show that you can be even more obscure in your sources, something I picked up purely by chance in Cambridge University Library uh, some years ago. And it was a flyer, a single flyer from the 19th century, undigitized. And it was a little paper done by hand and, and stereo, uh, what do you call it, um, you know, where you use the, the carbon paper. Um, uh, and um, it was a chap who appeared to, a British chap, who appeared to live in Yokohama in, in, uh, in Japan, which in the 19th century was a very significant trade center for uh, trade, um, imperial trade, but other trade within the Far East. And um, much neglected in Anglo-Japanese economic history, by the way, if anybody's into that field. Um, and the chappie is looking, uh, he's Mr. Punch from the traditional British Mr. Punch, uh, the same kind of nose, etc. So he's a pastiche of Mr. Punch uh, from Punch magazine. And he's the Japan Punch. And he claims that he's the best informed paper in the world. And it's obviously tongue in cheek published when the editor feels like it. Yeah, this is the point actually, that you know, some of um, many, in fact, I would say, of undiscovered or neglected newspapers from the golden age of newspapers, 19th century, turn of the century, um, were, and, and earlier, French revolutionary period, um, were um, kind of, uh, what you call it, narcissism publishing, you know, it was one person having something to say. I mean, even to the French Revolution favorites like Marat, you know, uh, did this in, in their own way. So he's, this is, uh, you know, self-publishing. Uh, and it, when he feels like it, so they didn't always have regular weekly or daily or whatever. Um, subscribe at once, I think that, and I'm not quite sure of the rest of the picture incidentally, there's a policeman about to uh, uh, arrest him. Looks like he's an imperial policeman. And behind is a laborer who seems to be working, um, doing some hard laboring of some sort. Um, right, so on the theme of specialist newspapers, uh, which, which is a really rich source, I feel, um, for events, for impact, for narrative. The narrative can be anybody's narrative, can't it, as we've seen already, but it might well be a movement rather than an individual. Japan Punch was an individual, an eclectic individual, uh, an eccentric individual. Um, but um, Labour women um, in Britain um, and elsewhere were definitely a movement, particularly in the days when um, there was no other representation of working class people apart from, well, I suppose you could say the Liberals did in, in, in Britain and, and uh, elsewhere. Um, but movements um, can actually produce, and this is my point, uh, and the movements and their newspapers produce Danton's collective consciousness. But it's a collective consciousness of their perception of, of, uh, of life, if you like. And that comes in two form, forms uh, as regards the title of our conference. The left hand side, if you look at the content page in 1923 for these women subscribers to the Labour Party's uh, newspaper for women, um, the, the articles are very thematic, aren't they? Labour saving devices. Wow, in those days, I mean, I've studied this paper and um, I went into it, incidentally, thinking 
I was going to look at the marriage bar. In 1921, the British government introduced uh, a, a marriage bar whereby if as a woman you got married, you had to leave the job because uh, you were expected to have kids and give way to a man coming, you know, returning from the war um, to have your, to release your job. And I thought that would be an outrage, you know, for any progressive women. So I started to look at this newspaper and, and their letters, the reader letters, very interesting for the impact, um, to see whether that was the case. And in fact, there was nothing. There was one letter. I looked at every edition for eight years, once a month. And um, well, I think it was fortnightly at one point, does it say? No. Um, and only found one letter from the teachers' union, that was it. So, but I found huge amounts of discussion amongst ordinary working class people, women, um, about labour saving devices. You know, these were the days when the women had to do washing by hand and, you know, a 12 hour day in the factory, etc. cetera. Um, so, uh, labour saving devices, of course, they couldn't afford it time um were but they were hugely attractive um the government neglecting the unemployed yes well we that's you know kind of obvious a woman's dream you know what they hope for in changes of policy and politics um what children did in the election that, that's interesting on the right hand side so those are all themes right on the right hand side we have an event, a big event, as minor strikes in Britain always have been. Um, what the minor strike uh, meant to women, and this was in 1920. Um, so events have, you know, their spin-off as well. Now, the motive, let's just talk briefly about the motivation for publishing such newspapers. The theoretical uh, roots, of course, are best um, illustrated by uh, Benedict Anderson um, in his theory of imagined communities, much quoted, although he uh, devised it originally in his study on 19th century nationalism. Um, but the idea is that uh, the newspaper, uh, and he gets his inspiration from a quote by Hegel, of course, as you, as you know, um, the newspaper brings together diverse people all over the place in different places at home reading the newspaper, and they all have their same thing that they share in common, the reading of the newspaper. So it's an imagined community, which is hugely important for media and journal these days. And it's not just mainstream, that, that's the point. So we need a wide definition. Right, almost there now. Um, this is the pièce de résistance of what I want to say to you about events. Because these two visuals deal with um, the two momentous events. Sorry, it's not Irish um, independence. I wish it was. Um, but in my view, the um, two most um, important events of the 20th century in terms of humanity. Um, the left hand is the atomic bomb, in this case, Hiroshima. Um, but also there was Nagasaki, of course, at the end of the, that brought the end to the Second World War, uh, with Truman pressing, agreeing the pressing of the button. And um, on the right hand side is uh, a French story from uh, occupied France in 1940 when the, the Nazis took over. And Jewish, French Jewish parents were very conscious that they were likely to be sent to Auschwitz they had already seen what was happening elsewhere and so most of them within the Jewish community decided to send their children away so that the children would not get arrested and sent to Auschwitz with them and so these children were sent to um, stranger families right and um, many years later in the 1980s um, uh, it came to light the story of the hidden children um, and French radio, uh, TF1, the, the public uh, broadcaster in France, put out a call for people who had lost children who were, were by that time, of course, in their 70s and 80s. Um, did they have any memories? And memory is important for us, don't forget, uh, for modern historians. Uh, well, memory can, you know, can be for any historian. Written word. Um, they put out a call for people who, and they were inundated 
and they were able to make a, a radio documentary for us from over 600 replies. Um, and that became a little book called Parole d'Etoile, um, which has a double meaning, um, of course, which is the word of the stars, uh, the words of the stars, but also um, the uh, Star of Israel, which Jews were forced to wear under Nazi regime. Um, and the book then became a comic book and the comic books became several versions. Um, and uh, this one is a nice big A4 version and it's divided um, into chapters. Each is the story of a different child who by now, you know, by the time they got to be published, um, has grown up. Um, and this is the opening one where an actress, the, the woman on the left, uh, knows that she has to flee. And she's a one parent family with a little girl. And she um, decides before she flees and says goodbye to her little girl, who's really so young she can hardly understand, that she should have a photo taken as, as memory uh, of her, of the two of them together. So she does that, and that's the photographer. And, um, you know, she's the photographer is having a conversation with her. It's difficult for you to read it with the quality of my slide, I'm sorry, once again. But he's saying, you've got it right. You know, you're right to send her off. It's the painful thing to do. Because she knows that she may never see her again. And um, she doesn't. Uh, uh, but uh, they, they, well, they briefly get together, uh, just to be a spoiler on the story, on this particular story, many years later. And um, they've drifted apart, but uh, they have a meeting together when just before the mother dies. Um, so these are very sad stories, very sad indeed. But um, the point of them is, and the reason I'm showing it to you, is that um, it shows that memory, it is a hugely important in the collective consciousness for our use of, of sources and our use of visual sources. Now, just a little bit um, to underline that on the left-hand one, this is um, a, a picture taken, it's, it's, it's drawn by Keiji Nagasa Nakazawa, right? And it was actually banned, the, he, he did 10 volumes, 10 volumes, called Barefoot Gen and I Saw It, of his memories of um, Hiroshima. He was six years old when it happened, when the atomic bomb uh, fell. He, he lost his father, his brother and his sister. And um, his mother, who was heavily pregnant at the, the day, the day, the, the bomb fell, uh, gave birth the same day. And uh, he and his, uh, six years old, he and his mother with the baby, um, the new, newborn baby, are forced to, uh, to, to roam the streets of Tokyo that is totally destroyed, um, or wherever they were in, in Japan, I can't remember. Um, and they are uh, treated as outcasts. Um, Hibush, hibushi, I think the, the Japanese word is, because survivors who are disabled and maimed, you know, are burned, etc., by the atomic fallout, are actually um, disowned from people who don't find themselves in that situation. So, ten volumes of memoirs of his childhood is a story of survival. It was actually banned in Japanese schools until recently which I think is appalling, but it was to do, I guess, with the Japanese not wanting to face the tremendous prejudice they showed their own people um, at the time, which of course is, is only part of the issue. But I commend this to you as um, a comic book um, that is worth check checking out, but also a source that is hugely detailed as a memory of childhood. Now on to Conclusion, and then we'll have some, some questions. For Now, how do we get impact, right? I've talked about events. Clearly, I've talked about narrative by implication, because there's been a narrative to the various um, 
slides I've shown you from my, my research, mainly from, well, yes, from my own research. Um, for impact, I believe events need to be combined with analysis of collective consciousness, according to Danton's theory, uh, and building on the theory of Sewell, who says that culture changes structures. Um, so this, this is what makes events so theoretically important, I believe. Um, this can be achieved, uh, the collective consciousness that is, via sources that may be unpredictable. That's one of the points I've been trying to make. You know, you haven't seen predictable sources here. You have seen minority sources by and large, um, and they are obscure some of them, they're undigitized and they're by minority neglected uh, people, but they provide a narrative. Um, so you can get the, the, the uh, narrative via, the, and this is my point, via, you know, it can be riots, it can be rumors, it can be songs, it can be posters, graffiti drawings. These all have their own sort of narrative uh, that can that can contribute to a collective consciousness that we need for seeing events in context. And I even believe that small acts of contemporary recording, such as that Japanese punch, uh, doesn't matter how eccentric, can contribute to collective consciousness. And the World War I soldier cartoons are a prime example of that. Um, and I think um, it's a shared perception of belonging. Back to Benedict Decht Anderson here, Imagine Communities, that helps crystallize perceptions of events. And, and these, the point is this for our conference, these are achieved via newspapers. It can be uh, studying newspapers as a source, and they were achieved at the time, that shared perception, through Imagine Communities of readers, all right? Um, the movement's own publications, whatever the movement is, yeah, uh, we, we discuss all, all, all these kind of things and achieve this shared perception. So it's always events and narrative plus that create impact, right? Because impact equals collective consciousness um, produced by events and narrative. And we, the historians, can reinterpret the impact from the time and, and recreate it. Now, these, these theoretical considerations apply to different periods of history, um, different contexts, and or different countries. Um, and I'm hoping that you can all apply them to your own history, your own research interest, and your own overview and, and motivation for what you're doing. Thanks. Ask me finish, Brendan. <laughs> well, thank you very much, um, uh, uh, Jane, for this fascinating and um, uh, very, I'd say, uh, wide ranging overview of um, the theoretical uh, aspect, the theoretical basis of what you're doing. Uh, and it's a possible application to so many other areas. And I think we've already seen uh, this morning uh, traces of areas where, for instance, your concept of, of um, emancipation and looking beneath the scenes um, uh, may apply. We talked about the uh, Massaniello aspect, for instance, uh, and the um, it, it, let's say rebellions and revolts, how are they treated in the press and what are the documents that might uh, subvert a kind of, of, um, of going theory. You've also made me think about the, um, in a way you remind me, I mean, you started off with um, new criticism and you reminded me a little bit about the, um, the, the one figure you left out, which was uh, Michel Foucault. Oh, and so in a way, this is a, um, it appears to me, I mean, this is, I mean, I wouldn't want to, um, let's say, miscarry, I, 
let's put it this way what you do is is uh, completely yours but um uh, the thought process that it initiates in an observer who's looking at the basic structures that you're working with um it tends to move in the direction of the notion of archaeology and so the sense that, that that there is a constructed view a constructive perception of events, of narratives, and so on. And it turns out that the closer you get, the closer you monitor, the closer you criticize the, let's say the ideology we might uh, call it, um, aware of the loaded aspect of that word. Uh, it, 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 nonetheless, um, beyond that, construction and that uh, creation that is so apparent, there is another story to be told. And what you're pointing out, and I think this is a, a, a great point, is that very often this other story is far more important than the one we appear to be seeing. So there's a um, exciting in a way, a much, a, a much more um, creative story or a, a story that uh, inspires or incites uh, creativity in a way that the that the former construction could not because perhaps the construction had something to do with building what could not be created upon uh, in other words precluding further development in unexpected directions in order to you might say kind of keep things uh, under wraps. So uh, um, I had a lot of, of, um, of, of thoughts and questions about um, specific aspects, but uh, I thought it might be interesting at this point to um, uh, move to some of the questions that I see in our chat. And I think one, one way to um, start off the chat part would be to stop sharing your screen and that way we can see some of the hands raised. Shall we try that? Yeah, okay. Do you want to do it for me or do I do it? Um, um, it's, uh, there you go. Ah, right. Bingo. Okay. <laughs> Done. Okay, so hands raised. Uh, uh, Katrina uh, already has her hand raised. And so please unmute. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can, Katrina. Hi. Hello. Thank you very much for your talk, Jane. That was really interesting. I'm not a historian. Um, I'm a Germanist, but I have an example that I'd, I'd love you to talk about because I think it relates to the tension between neglected voices and um, collective consciousness. So you're drawing on Darnton's theorization of collective consciousness. And I wanted to ask how heterogeneous his understanding is of such a consciousness. So I can see how it relates to ideas of imagined community, perhaps collective memory or cultural memory, group identity and so on. What happens to the voices that feel themselves that they do not belong in this collective? So an example would be the event of the fall of the Berlin Wall, which very much shapes a perception of belonging in the kind of way you've been outlining. So we can't understand the reporting of that event without understanding what it's doing for German national identity. There's really interesting work coming out now um, by uh, German studies scholars around how that event was perceived by ethnic minorities at the time, uh, both in the GDR and in the in the Federal Republic, mm. who felt themselves very marginalized and in fact threatened um, by what was happening. Um, so I think that's a nice example where the neglected voice might actually be um, sitting in a, in a different or a slant the the collective consciousness and are you talking then about multiple nested collective consciousnesses not all of which could be easily absorbed into each other or or how how would such relationships work in this model okay that's a really good question if i can just back brandon you're quite right about this and that is a um you know i really should be adding him as well <laughs> you're quite right I, I really wanted to position it with um close to historical sources, but the archaeology of knowledge is, is seminal. And, uh, yeah. um, Katrina, yeah, that's um, your, your first point, question is about Danton himself. Yeah, he has, if you look at his scholarship, he's confined himself to the French Revolution and the outbreak of the French Revolution and the year before, right? Um, and so his current book, where he comes up with this collective consciousness, 
is actually looking at um, 1788. But what he does is he looks um, very specifically within that period. So for instance, the Great Cat Massacre, very specific <clears throat> a, you know, story of during the French Revolution, how they ordered the massacre of the cat, which I do cats, so it really <laughs> upsets me. Um, but he, he winds it to the bigger uh, significance of that particular uh, year or years. And he looks at all sorts of sources. Um, and so rather than just looking at one or two sets of sources, he'll bring in everything, yeah? Everything that can possibly contribute. Um, so that's one way of, of doing it, um, which I think is very good because you get a very in-depth, but you get very wide collective consciousness from the different sorts of, of sources that you can use, you know, songs, posters, cartoons, etc. Um, the Berlin Wall, you're quite right about this, of course. Uh, just a, a quick story, um, going back to when I was a television producer, we did a big series for BBC One called Europe by Design, and it went out in 1992 to coincide with the opening of the trade bar uh, uh, barriers, right, or the breaking of trade barriers. Um, and it was the angle was, um, what can you find out about the cultural uh, awareness of different European countries um, by, you know, in, by looking at kind of travel cultural stuff, look, looking at what they're up to. And we were in um, Prenzlauerberg in, in Berlin. Um, and uh, we talked to, this is a community which was in East Berlin. Uh, but right on the border, has since become very gentrified, you know, lovely big Georgian houses like you get in Dublin, like you get in London, Bath, etc. And um, they were being set fire to it, seriously. I mean, there was, we, we were filming and there was, we didn't expect that, we didn't go to film. Uh, these fire engines everywhere, they were being called out, Nina, Nina, all the time. And um, the reason they were being set fire to is speculators were already um, realizing the significance of the fall of the wall and they were um, trying to set fire to them so they could get insurance and then would know there, there would be no queries over the ownership of the property come, um, you know, the onset of capitalism. And the, um, uh, the community themselves were outraged. Right? And they felt what emerged from our interviews with the community was that they felt very insecure about the fact that they were born because they had uh, families, they had nurseries, they had security, neighborhood security with backup through communism that they were about to lose, right? Which, um, you know, uh, uh, childcare, particularly from a woman's point of view. So you're quite right about the different ways of seeing the Berlin Wall. And I think there's big mileage in the ethnic one. Yeah. Uh, Roseanne? Oh, Hi. Do I see a question here? All right, Roseanne. I don't see Roseanne on, question, on the screen. Okay, there. Do, Roseanne, do you want to? Uh, the chest, Brendan. Yeah. Okay. So um, Roseanne is asking. Okay. There's Roseanne. Hi, Hi Sorry, Roseanne. Here I am. Okay. Hello, um, Roseanne. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Professor Chapman. Uh, I have a question about well the the icon events and and um, some events that did not uh, get a lot of media coverage at the time. Um, what do you think about this? How important is media coverage for the um, well for for modern memory for um, collective consciousness. Right, okay. So this depends, uh, I think it, the importance depends on what period of history you're talking about. I mean, clearly contemporary, uh, very con present day almost, um, social media will, you know, be uh, in the equation. Yeah? And the internet is as a milestone. Before then, when we look at media history, we're looking at a gradual loosening of, um, or a gradual extending, a, a gradual loosening of controls, freedom of speech, right? Over many hundred years in most cases. Um, 
and uh, a gradual democratization of sources of access to the media. Yeah. So if you look at the earliest newspapers, they reported mainly on trade, you know, share prices and shipping. Yeah. That was a very small minority of people who would be interested in that. Going back early modern, you can argue Carantos or, or whatever were an earlier form of newspaper. But to argue that, you have to say, well, um, the news can appear as a song, yeah, or a poem or a town crier or uh, whatever, which actually I referred to, you know, rumors uh, is, is, is a town crier, um, songs, etc., the, the, the poems, Carantos. Now, if you include all of those, uh, then um, you can say media goes back a long way, yeah. Um, but uh, the theoretical underpinning for that really is new cultural history, I would, I would say, uh, which was my theoretical starting point. Um, so uh, it's more difficult to talk of media when you get back earlier, unless you extend the sources, right? I once got, um, I was requested once uh, to write a history of the media um, in a series being published by Bloomsbury online, right? I turned the request down uh, because they wanted me to, uh, to write the 17th century, yeah, which is not my period. However, um, I would have possibly seen it as a learning uh, exercise or referred them to another 17th century specialist if it hadn't been for one thing. And this was what really upset me about this public, right? They had a format. So, so their idea was they were gonna have media history going back, you know, to right from the early through to the present, but and, and in, in a kind of series online, a bit like an encyclopedia. But every century, right, a different contribution would follow the, the same format, yeah? So, you know, you would always, and, and you had to hit as the writer, certain headings, right? Um, and they would be the same for every uh, century, right? And I said, no, you can't do that. You cannot apply these same headings to the 17th century that you've got for the 21st century. So it, media history is problematic, but that's what makes it so exciting. Um, and it depends how you construe it and where. Right, um, because if, if it, you know, some countries it's linked with colonialism or with development, yeah, and that makes it difficult because availability of sources is tricky as well. I'm thinking African history in Africa and literacy, which is why songs and verbal things are important. But how do you find out about them? That's not easy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, we have a, um, a question from Joel Herman. Yeah, thank, thanks so much uh, for that fantastic talk. Uh, my question uh, connected to one of the previous questions, but it was just around Anderson and Imagine Communities and how, uh, you know, he united uh, the community in the widest category, just the reader. Uh, and it was just kind of around now, how do we rebuild collective consciousness uh, when that collective consciousness includes, you know, many competing ideologies and views of these events? And how do we combine and use uh, the unpredictable and obscure sources you talk about? You know, is it just to provide as many of these views as, as possible or, or just, just on that? Yeah. Um, no, I, I think uh, you have to have a kind of, I mean, pluralism is important as a starting point, yeah? But always, when you interrogate any primary source, um, but particularly newspapers, if you start going to more specialist ones, the first question is who publishes this, right? And if it's not mainstream legacy media, well, even if it is mainstream legacy media, maybe even if it is the Irish Times or whatever, you, you still have to, to say, you know, who is the readership? Who publishes it? And so you can build up a collection, um, a, you know, a variety of sources. But I tend to, uh, to prefer to go beyond that, right? And to set a theme, 
And this is the this is the reason I showed you the book cover of that gender citizenship and newspaper, because the theme there was citizenship. Yeah. Um, women struggling to achieve citizenship, which I construed as the vote, yeah, and um, platforms for freedom in the case of Indian independence, because the Indian women actually got the vote uh, pretty uh, early on in the 1920s. Um, and uh, so, you know, it's the, the, the theme is citizenship, but the, the theoretical perspective is gender in that case. Right now, it doesn't always have to be uh, gender. I mean, Brendan has has um, uh, suggested a, a Foucault uh, as a theoretical perspective, um, but that will guide the way you organise and marshal the sources. And I don't think it's just a question of getting as many different sources as possible. I think it's um, a question of marshalling them when you have. Uh, you know, some that you are considering according to the priorities that you have as a writer, which is set by your research question, right? I mean, this is what I tell undergrads as well. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, um, it's, it's a bit basic, you know, but it's basic research methodology. But I, I think it holds good because once you have a research question, that is, if, once you problematize your theme, around a research question, that excludes um, certain things, maybe not totally, but it gives you priority. So you may find there's one newspaper that's wonderful and others that are just not very helpful for you. I mean, I found this with the black press. So for instance, I found that the, the masses of black uh, newspapers from the United States um, were very good for theoretical underpinning of black studies, this kind of thing. From at the time, you know, they were um, talking about it um, from the 1920s and even before then, from the late 19th century. Um, but that didn't mean to say that I wanted to focus on them. I mentioned them by all means, because they were inspirational for my writers that I wanted to focus on. Um, that were, in the case of that Black Media book, which is on the very first slide, um, that were um, neglected Black newspapers uh, produced by Black people in Britain in the 1920s and 30s, right, which hadn't been written about before. Now, the danger is you get misunderstood, you know, when you're, you prioritise and set your research angle. That was my research angle. But the damn publishers, sorry, I keep criticizing publishers. I hope there aren't any in the audience. Um, but uh, <laughs> um, uh, I showed you, <laughs> I showed you two book covers at the very, that very first slide, right? And they were both book covers for the same book. The top one, uh, and it was called, it was called Black Media. That book. Um, the top one, I rejected. It was a photo of a London bus, a bus with an advert going along the side for the News of the World, right? News of the World, British newspaper, you say, no longer, you know, doesn't operate anymore. Scurrilous rag, yeah? Um, you know, divorce, scandal, etc. News of the World, Sunday newspaper, that is a tabloid that was famous for, right? I said to the publisher, I said, you can't have that. I'm not talking about tabloid scurrilous values of divorce and sex and, and, and affairs and this kind of tabloid nonsense, right? I'm talking about black citizenship in their own papers, right? And so I made, I, well, I asked and they kindly agreed the publishers to withdraw that suggestion. And they came up with another, which was kind of innocuous, which was newsprint, you know, the old print letters. Uh, which was actually what is on the cover now of that book, um, were you to take a look at it. So um, you can be misunderstood. I think that's my point, John. Um, but the way you make yourself clear is through your research question and through prioritising sources. Great, thanks so much. Well, uh, thank you. And now uh, we have um, one more question from um, Davide. Yes. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can, David. Thank you, Professor Chapman, for this uh, brilliant 
uh, paper. So my question is, uh, well, general kind of a more uh, Brodelian uh, interrogative question, like if you can actually um, develop a bit on the structure, on event structure, then uh, I, my question is, could actually see the collective consciousness as a collective in a way experience? So the news and event as something that all people are experiencing in their life, and then I think that also coming to your point on uh, neglected voices and also the way uh, the primary resources are treated. So uh, do you think, so could you say something more about the, an issue that I think is the underlying issues and who control the publishing of primary resources? Because for example, I remember to have read this article on the publication of um, um, the state papers, the English state papers, and I remember that there were a lot of uh, the, the the author said that at the, at the end of 19th century there were problems to publish sources on Irish history. So maybe you know uh, if you go on this portal where there is a lot of let's say Washington Post, all the archives online, and New York Times, everything is online. Obviously, this creates a way to. And final one is. Actually, we cannot talk about maybe the history of media, but I think that maybe media history could be a strategical anachronism to bring together like a, something that, you know, was not used in the past, this, uh, the, the, the word media, but still we can use to approach and to understand uh, this phenomenon historically. Wow. <laughs> I don't know, you've got so many points there, uh, David. Um, uh, first, the structure um, uh, of events. Well, they, it's going to vary, it's going to vary. However, um, the, there is a predictable structure of certain events. Um, I mean, revolutions, for instance. Um, the scholars have analysed the structure of events, uh, you know, where you get the cause of the outbreak, um, and then you get the kind of mushrooming um, of the uh, rebellion uh, or, or revolution. And then you get the stage of idealism when it first, uh, the event first breaks out. You know, French Revolution is a prime example of this, Russian Revolution is another. Um, and, and then uh, some would say you then get the kind of control by the, um, uh, the small controlling minority, you know, the Leninist view. <coughs> And uh, this kind of vanguard control, and, and then you get the kind of disintegration or, or the institutionalization of the of, of what comes out of it. Uh, I mean, that's kind of broad picture, and I'm not saying every event uh, covers that structure, but there has been work done on on the way events are structured. I think it depends on the event, right? But I think there are common themes, and I do think a comparative, or there aren't always common themes. I mean, you can have a, I, I, I suppose, um, a totally one-off event, um, if it's very small. I think. If it's big, I suspect that um, you can do a comparison, right? Now, I don't say do comparison of everything, um, but um, you have to compare like with like. And, and if you can, I mean, with some difference, obviously, but sufficient shared in common to make a comparison. Media history can be the umbrella of that. You're quite right, I think. Um, but the way you phrased it, Davida, is you're saying it could be how we use the present to analyze the past. And um, historians do that anyway. You know, we're always colored. Um, and I guess literary writers as well. We're always colored by the present in the way we view the past. Um, I mean, my neglected voices is actually typical of that. You know, it's identity politics, isn't it? Which is very fashionable at the moment. Um, although I like to think that I did it not one of the first, but I've been doing it a long time. Um, so uh, yes, use media history as the umbrella, um, but um, uh, be aware of colouring it with the present too much, I think. Um, the collective consciousness and who controls the sources, that's a very interesting one, and you're absolutely right, because there are situations within journalism history, 
where the freedom of the press and freedom of expression has uh, been so limited that the sources, the apparent sources, appear to be lim limited. They're always biased, of course. There's always a question of objectivity or subjectivity and who controls them. And editorial bias, you know, as, as well. Um, but, you know, that can be tarted up as the news values of the particular newspaper itself. And the news values is, is, a, is a, um, a concept from journalism studies that I quite like actually and I heard it from some people um, because uh, it can help you understand individual publications and where they're coming from. What, what are their news values? They don't always see it as shock horror news or exciting news for this because it's not um, they may just say, see it as the need to keep their communities together by reading this people's publication. And um, that is where Benedict An Anderson comes in, I think. It, it's uniting the readership. Uh, and it may not be exciting news. So this is why I say I think there's all sorts of intellectual tensions around the topic of the conference, which is why you chose it's excellent because it allows people like me to, um, uh, to, to say, ah, oh, yes, but there's so-and-so as well. <laughs> it's discursive. Um, but uh, also, you know, we, we, there's a tension within the various elements of our work as scholars, I believe. And I deliberately say scholars, not historians, because you may not be a historian. Okay. Excellent. Well, of course, um, historians wear many hats, as you know. Uh, yes, that's right, me included. <laughs> indeed. So it, once again, thank you so much for this um, illuminating um, talk and uh, responses to our um, many questions. Um, we, uh, uh, a collective um, virtual applause, and um, we hope you enjoy the uh, rest of the day um, in our, uh, our, uh, our conference uh, uh, and uh, with uh, whatever else you happen to be doing these days, the best of luck and we'll be back in touch. So Thank thanks once much. again I to change. I hope I see you again, you guys. Okay, excellent. I'd excellent. love to come to Ireland again. <laughs> splendid, splendid. Oh, well, we would love to have.